Uh, the title of my talk is Deliberative Democracy for Diabolical Times. That's also a title of the title of a book that I'm uh, writing with Andre Bechtegger, who many of you know, um, which I hope will be finished soon. Um, and I, what I'm going to do today is actually pick out a, a few a, a few themes from the book, which also speak to the the concerns of uh, this, uh, this this three part series, as um, as just outlined by Adele. Um, so let's just give let me just give you a bit of history. Um, so just by way of a bit of background, uh, in in 2019, uh, uh, Andre and I and a co well, it seems a cast of thousands. Uh, uh, co-authored this this paper that was published in Science called "The Crisis of Democracy in the Science of Deliberation." Uh, so, um, the and just by way of a bit of, of deeper background, the 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 rise of deliberative democracy in the last um, I don't know decade or more in well both not just the academic world but also in the practice of democratic innovation has also it seems coincided with um, a backsliding um, of democracy more generally. So the question is how how ought deliberative democracy uh, face that situation and how might we respond um, uh, to the crisis of democracy? So that was the concern of the 2019 article. Um, However, the, the 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 crisis of democracy now seems a bit twenty uh, tens, and uh, there's really there's there's, uh, there's been far too many books on it uh, published lately. Um, also, uh, crisis in the singular implies one big challenge um, with potential systemic transformation in response, um, and so we've decided to frame the book um, slightly differently, um, and that's where the the diabolical framing comes in. Uh, Sorry. Um, okay. So, what does diabolical mean? Diabolical means literally characteristic of the devil. Um, however, the devil is clever. So, diabolical is not just supposed to be a synonym for things that are evil or bad. Um, so, challenges, we argue, are diabolical when they have multiple dimensions, um, when they're potentially catastrophic, when they're subtle and connected. And Crucially, there are clever operators who have figured out how to prosper in, in this kind of environment. So um, in the case of the kind of di diabolical soundscape that we're talking about, um, these might include, uh, these clever operators might um, include um, uh, unscru unscrupulous uh, media moguls and the people the people they hire, um, think of Fox News and the Murdoch Empire, um, populist demagogues, um, uh, extremists who use new technologies to increase their support base, um, uh, people who can support, uh, sorry, can distort norms of even handedness to make things like climate change denial and pandemic denial seem like legitimate positions. Authoritarian governments who learned how to simulate democracy and, and uh, so, and, and even actually use things which uh, can look like um, deliberative devices in order to um, bolster their own, their own authoritarian rule. Um, and also do things like um, uh, sponsor troll armies um, to har harass their opponents. Um, but there's not just clever operators here. Um, we can also look at the presence of, um, of, of not so clever operators who have stumbled on effective, uh, effective, effective strategies to prosper in this um, kind of environment. So people like uh, Donald Trump, for example. Um, okay. Um, I remember thinking to last week's um, seminar, one, one of the slides that, uh, that Axel showed was of a of a of a an, an extreme right wing protester um, listing a, a lot of things that they opposed, and uh, um, it all said on the placard, um, "Brought to you by Satan." Uh, so we've, it seems we've got the devil on both sides. However, um, for us, uh, the devil is a metaphor. I think for the person who wrote that placard and held it up, the devil is a real thing. Um, okay, but um, what one of the things that uh, one of the take-home messages uh, that, that I took from uh, Axel's seminar last week um, is that it's important to be clear-eyed about what's important in this diabolical soundscape, what's really challenging to democracy in general, and what's not. Um, so in other words, we shouldn't just um, follow the, the moral panic about things like echo chambers um, and filter bubbles. Um, we should take a close look at what's, as I say, what 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 is important and what's not. Um, and as we've been working on this book, um, 
uh, it, it seems, well, from my perspective, things have got a bit more complicated that some of the things that I thought um, we should uh, we should treat as um, as empirically important as made a challenges um, turn out um, not to be so not to, not to be so crucial. And so here's here's some of the things uh, which uh, um, are arguably not so important. Um, the first is um, filter bubbles and echo chambers, and this this is really just um, going back to uh, Axel's presentation of last week, uh, where he, uh, uh, I think, demonstrated quite convincingly that the empirical evidence, the existence of those, is uh, is pretty minimal or maybe non-existent. Um, the, the 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 second thing is uh, uh, the uh, attributing problems to big shifts in public opinion. Um, this may not, in fact, uh, be true. That um, There's a, a very striking book um, by Larry, Larry Bartels that was recently published um, called uh, uh, Democracy Arose from the Top, which is about populism in Europe and relies on uh, looking at surveys over time in multiple countries. Um, and what he finds is that um, pop, right-wing populist attitudes have, have not increased over the uh, um, over the years, or even or, or even in, or even decades. What's ch what's changed is really the behaviour of leaders. Um, now, um, populist attitudes may have always been there in a certain proportion of the population, but they they haven't in, increased over time. Um, uh, so uh, again, we shouldn't simply assume that that's uh, that, that, you know there's a it, it's, it's, it would be very easy to conclude from the success of um, right-wing populist leaders that they're reflecting changes in public attitudes, but it turns out, if Bartels is right, that they're not. Um, third thing, fake news. Um, in a prominent article published um, two years ago by um, Simone Chambers, um, of course, well-known deliberative democracy scholar, uh, she asks in the subtitle, is fake news destroying the public sphere? Um, well, it's hard to see how it could. Um, and the site here is an article by um, Alan et al, um, published in Science in um, in in in, tw in twenty. Actually, it was it's supposed to be Science twenty twenty. I think I've got the year on there. Um, anyway, uh, to, to quote from that article, uh, fake news comprises only 0.15 percent of Americans' daily media diet. Um, so, fake news in this light um, seems to be empirically a truly marginal phenomenon. Uh, Motivated reasoning. Um, this this is a uh, this is the the idea of motivated reasoning is um, is 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 often seen as part of the explanation for the uh, uh, for for the rise of polarization and and its intractability. Um, now, the idea of motivate, make, motivated reasoning is that people process information um, in such a way as to support their existing positions. Um, so that means that trying to reach them through um, argument and evidence um, um, can be pretty futile. Um, however, there's um, uh, a recent book um, by Alexander Kopok um, called Persuasion in Parallel, uh, which contains, uh, well, what I found, um, some fairly convincing uh, refutations of some of the classic studies on motivated reasoning. And what um, Kopok shows, I mean, what, what he does actually in, in, some, of, in some, of the, some of what he does in the book is that he tries to replicate those studies and finds that if he follows the procedures that are actually followed by those, by the researchers, um, original researchers, um, he gets the same results. Uh, but then he points out that there were uh, um, often major flaws in their des experimental designs, which once corrected, um, uh, show that motivated reasoning uh, does not seem to be pervasive. That what happens instead is that... Um, uh, people change their minds in the direction of persuasive information, irrespective of the side of the that, that they take on the issue at hand, and that's what he calls parallel persuasion. Now, if it weren't for the existence of prior work on motivated reasoning, that would be an entirely unremarkable finding, uh, perhaps not even worth publishing. Uh, it, but it's it's but because of the, the of previous work on motivated reasoning that um, would lead people to think the opposite, that um, uh, that Kopok's um, book is actually quite striking. Um, related to this is something that's uh, sometimes called the back backfire effect, where uh, the presentation of, um, of contradictory information, informa uh, information that contradicts people's uh, prior positions, leads people to cling even more strongly to their position. That's the idea of the backfire effect. Um, seems there's been a host of studies uh, lately which um, show that this um, this rarely applies, and I, um, 
So the uh, Swire Thompson et al. is, um, is, is one such study. Um, so in other words, uh, we shouldn't necessarily get drawn into a moral panic um, about all the terrible things that are happening um, online and uh, online and elsewhere. Um, that things uh, may be a bit more a bit more complicated. Um, okay. Whoops. Um, so, um, so what you know? The title of our book is "Diabolic Has Diabolical Times in It." So, what remains is diabolical. Um, I don't want to completely undermine uh, the title of the book and suggest there's nothing to worry about. Um, so, here's here's some things that uh, that we should worry about. Uh, the the first one is the uh, an imbalance between expression and reflection. Uh, deliberative democracy is, is of course, uh, um, not just about um, not about um, uh, uh, not 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 just about giving voice, but also about listening and reflecting. Um, and in an article that was uh, published in uh, in Policy and Politics a few, uh, three years ago, um, Selena Urchan. Uh, Caroline Hendricks and, and, and myself uh, argued that, um, that the, this 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 problem of an overload of expression uh, not being accompanied by enough opportunity for reflection um, is one key to the to contemporary problems. Um, the contemporary problems of afflicting the uh, the communi the communicative soundscape of, of of democracy that it's never been easier to give voice. Uh, and but it's um, but the the sheer um, the, the sheer quantity of of, of, of communication um, threatens to um, overload people's reflective capacities. So so that's uh, so so that's one real problem. It's not necessarily the low quality of expression. It's uh, it's it's just the sheer volume. Um, so uh, and one of one of the uh, one of the um, very prominent paper I can cite and support here is um, there was an article published by Gary King and others in the American Political Science Review in 2017 um, on it was it was on um, China's government sponsored so social media deluge and they have uh, apparently the Chinese government um, has hundreds of thousands of people working for it to provide social media content. Um, and what they, what uh, what King and King et al conclude is that this this deluge isn't designed to refute opponents or or, or critics. Um, it's simply just designed to distract the public away from issues that might be um, uncomfortable for the government. Um, so this is strategic use of an overload of expression, um, overwhelming the reflective capacities of uh, of, uh, of of the of, of the citizenry. Um, uh, next, um, lack of argumentative complexity. Well, obviously, this is this has always been true in politics. The use of um, of the use of simple slogans, uh, but or, or and often simplistic slogans. So maybe this has been also been true. But arguably, um, as the complexity of problems um, incre increases, uh, this is uh, this is this this and this 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 reliance upon simple slogans as a uh, is a is a or simplistic slogans is um is more of a problem. Um, so so think of the the simple simplistic so slogans as, as accompanying Brexit. You know, Brexit means Brexit and things like this. Uh, when you, what you've got is a very complex relationship of relationship between um, the UK and the the European the European Union. Um, misinformation and lies. Um, you don't need to rely on fake news here. Um, that there, there are many ways of uh, engaging in uh, uh, the production of misinformation. Um, so think again of Brexit. The the three the the the, the, the well known argument um, by Brexit Brexit uh, uh, leaders that uh, that uh, Brexit would enable um, three hundred fifty million pounds a, a week that was currently being sent to the European Union to be devoted to other things like national health service. That was simply that was simply untrue. Um, there's another uh, uh, very effective uh, misinformation strategy, is the one that's um, set out in the in book by um, S Areskis and Conway a few years ago, um, Merchants of Doubt, um, where the basic idea is to uh, uh, con confront um, uh, uh, if, if if you're faced with an issue like climate change um, and you're the fossil fuel industry and you know that action on it is going to be bad for you. Um, then what you do is you try to sow doubt 
that climate change is occurring. Um, you try to create the impression that there really are two legitimate sides on an issue, and you, it's possible to take advantage of the balanced doctrine, balanced doctrines in the media, for example, to uh, make sure that a, a climate a, a climate scientist is always accompanied um, uh, by a climate change denier. Uh, in a in, in a um, uh, in, in, any, in any coverage of the of, of the of the issue, um, and so Arescus and Conway um, show how um, just a, a, a well financed um, uh, uh, campaign over the years has has taken advantage of of this of this this kind of situation um, to try to establish that there is doubt when it comes to climate change, the existence of um, anthropogenic climate change when there really isn't. And they look back to um, how that's done on the issue on the link between uh, uh, tobacco, uh, tobacco um, smoking, and cancer. And, uh, and in many ways, the same strategies were employed. Um, eventually, they didn't work, but they protected uh, several decades of profit for the uh, tobacco industry. Um, uh, next is uh, yeah, simple disregard for strand standards of truth and logic. Um, it seems that epistemically damaged sides can win sometimes, and so Trump and Brexit would be the uh, the, the obvious uh, e examples here. Um, okay, the, the the role of soft news again. This this is something that um, that Axel Bruns has uh, uh, highlighted um, the importance of. Uh, this is one way for um, the fringe, it seems fringe ideas can get now get into the mainstream. Um, so, for example, um, uh, uh, so so soft soft news in includes um, things like coverage of entertainment, um, sports, and 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 so forth. Um, and so, uh, uh, celebrities um, might, uh, uh, for example, endorse a link between. Um, the rollout of 5G technology and COVID. So previously, uh, 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 just a crazy fringe idea. Um, but if it gets uh, 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 repeated by a, by a celebrity, then it can enter enter the main the mainstream. So that's um, um, so again, that's just that's just um, one sort of uh, problematic route uh, uh, in in into mainstream discourse. Um, okay, uh, next is um, cultural cognition. Um, now this is I think this one now um, has a, a big question mark on it um, by it um, because the if, if we're if we're skeptical about motivated reasoning, then we ought to be skeptical about um, cultural cognition too. Um, now the idea of cultural cognition um, as propounded by um, people like uh, Dan Kahan in studies of climate change in the US is that uh, belief in the reality or otherwise of climate change um, is is not a matter of uh, a contemplation of, of any evidence um, but rather it's a marker of identity of the individual um, so one marker of uh, conservative or right-wing Republican identity um, is is that you have to deny climate change but then the same is true uh, for liberal uh, democratic identity at the other end of the, of the spectrum it's a marker of your identity that you have to you have to believe in the reality of anthropogenic climate change um but it seems that um oh, oh, oh sorry just um uh sorry just backtrack a bit sorry um and in this light um uh, um there's a study by McCrite and dunlap again on climate change um, which shows that um higher education and self-reported familiarity with climate science among republicans actually leads to reduced concern with climate change um, so what that suggests is um, evidence and argument. Um, it's a bit like the backfire effect, um, if you like. Evidence and argument are going to uh, 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 to reduce concern with 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 climate change. Um, but it seems that um, uh, most of most well, in fact, virtually all the studies of cultural con uh, cultural cognition have been done in the U.S. Um, and only on a few issues like climate change. And my own feeling is that only ca it only captures um, some extremes, extremes on some issues, um, and only in the U.S. And that um, there's a big question mark um, over its um, broader validity. Um, okay, next is um, online civil incivility. Um, this, this is just the um, ease with which it's, it's now possible to um, 
um, insult people uh, when it comes to well things. If you read, uh, you know, ever scroll down to the uh, the comments section below um, articles posted online, for example, and just how easily things uh, 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 descend into vitriol. Um, again, um, some issues more prone to this than others. I mean, climate change. I mean, yeah, climate change. It's almost guaranteed that um, that it will. Uh, uh, to generate into vitriol very quickly, at least in um, places like Australia and the the, the US. Um, okay, next, um, the e extremist media ecosystem. Um, obviously, operations like the Murdoch Empire, especially in the US, with things like um, uh, with 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 uh, uh, Fox News um, being the most uh, notorious example. But in the US, there are now even more um, extreme operations like. Um, um, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, News America, um, one, one Max that uh, uh, that um, that they're even more extreme, and obviously they've uh, they've uh, figured out how to prosper um, uh, through messaging that um, outrages and uh, uh, and 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 really stirs up their their audience, and uh, there's some. Um, um, yeah, there, there are studies which show that this, uh, that this, this, this kind of ex this right-wing extremist media ecosystem in in the U.S. at least um, um, really just uh, does live in a in in a somewhat different world um, it, it, with than than the 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 mainstream media ecosystem, which um, which extends from what to be uh, moderate Republicans to the um, to the to to the left of the political spectrum, so it's it seems that this this extremist eco media ecosystem has uh, um, uh, has has managed to to uh, develop this not not quite a separate reality, um, but but does seem to be um, sort of detached from the way the uh, the, the the mainstream media ecosystem uh, views the world. Um, how important is it? Um, in a study by um, Druckmann and McLean in 2018, um, they they show that um, only around 15% uh, of viewers in the US actually watch partisan news channels, especially, well, that, especially right wing partisan news channels. Um, however, um, Druckmann and McLean uh, show that it's not just people who actually view it that who are affected, but also the people that that fifteen percent talk to, who seem just as influenced um, as the people who actually do watch it. So the influence is a bit uh, uh, can be a bit stronger than uh, that the fifteen percent figure would suggest. Um, uh, diabolical elites and leaders who have figured out how to prosper in this communicative environment. Um, again, uh, are people like uh, Trump, um, um, other. Uh, uh, Populist uh, authoritarian leaders, um, Orban in Hungary, um, Erdogan in, in in Turkey, uh, or others who who seem to have um, been able to um, to prosper in the, in this kind of environment. Um, and then finally, uh, like I mentioned earlier, um, government sponsored uh, troll armies who who use uh, um, use digital technologies to um, to harass opponents of the regime, and uh, the, these exist in um, in China, India, um, Russia. Um, so some the, so those are some of the things uh, to worry about um, in the uh, uh, the contemporary dialogical soundscape. Um, so, oops. Hang on. Um, okay. So, um, in in the book, um, we then sort of zoom in from the the, the soundscape as, as a whole um, to the problematic categories of people who seem to be able to flourish in it, and this this includes both leaders. Um, active, well, leaders and activists on the one side, and and citizens on the other, who might be attracted to these, uh, uh, to the to the to these problematic positions. And so we have uh, chapters in the book um, on right wing populists. Um, populists are normally uh, defined um, as well. Populism is normally de defined as a doctrine which. Uh, is based on a core distinction between a pure people and a corrupt elite. Um, populism 
populist gen populism generally also involves uh looking to a leader who can embody the will of the people um it, it kept right-wing populism in particular can involve um uh, nativism that's um a definition of the people um usually in uh, uh, ethnic or otherwise um exclusive terms um and uh populism is problematic for democracy because uh people populist attitudes uh, tend not to see the need for um, anything in the way of, of political pluralism uh, because uh, there is uh, there there is no legitimate diversity of of views that needs reconciling that the will the, the will of the people is is one proper thing um uh next we uh we, we also have a chapter on um, um extremism and uh uh, for the purposes of the book, um, we, we take the uh, definition of extremism from the uh, democratic um, resilience that um, um, that, uh, uh, that Selena Jan and uh, 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 Jordan Jordan McSwinney and and others who were working on on well uh, many other people working on on this project on um, on democratic resilience. Um, so extremists are those who want to fracture the public sphere, um, either pushing. Uh, some group out of it. So, for example, an, an unpopular um, uh, religious minority or a, a minority um, uh, based on ethnicity or what, whatever. Um, or, on the other hand, um, people who want to pull a group out of um, the public sphere. So, um, Islamist extremists, for example, um, who want to pull Muslims um, out of the public sphere in uh, um, in, in Western societies. Um, so that's our definition of um, ex extremism. Um, and in some ways, um, extremists pose a, they, a, a, extremists are so defined, they may be smaller in number, but in, in, in some ways they prov pr pr provide a bigger challenge with populists because populist, populism actually, actually, actually has a, um, uh, a, a reasonable idea at its core that, that there is a difference between, uh, uh, the the people and the elite who control things. It's just that populists um, systematically misidentify who the elite is. Um, that uh, I mean, uh, it, it seems entirely reasonable to to see uh, to, to see to see most uh, um, 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 certainly most uh, liberal democratic states these days as, as being dominated dominated by um, a relatively small economic elite, and so we do get um, increasing um, inequality, uh, income income and wealth inequality, for example. Um, but extremists are a bit more a challenge because they don't, there isn't that sort of um, uh, half re well, not just half reason, but reasonable idea at the, at the core. Um, third, uh, deniers, um, people who can deny. Um, the existence of anthrop anthropogenic climate change, um, uh, deny election results, even when there's you know, the, the election results are clearly valid um, and votes have been fairly counted. Um, and then pandemic denial, um, this which can take many forms, sort of, uh, uh, but basically sort of denying the, the best the, the best the best scientific evidence um, on the, on the cause of pandemic, on the effects of vaccines and different treatments and and so forth. Um, then uh, authoritarians, another category. Um, authorit the authoritarian chapter is actually uh, uh, divided up into four things um, listed in the the, the brackets here. Um, the, the 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 new style authoritarianism is um, what's called in a recent in recent uh, work by John Keane um, the new despotism, um, in which uh, authoritarians and autocrats autocratic regimes don't rely on old style repression. Uh, they're much more subtle in the, the kind of social control they use, um, and uh, and and some of the things, um, um, some some of the thing, some of the devices they employ actually look on the service, so they're deliberative, and they do involve things like public consultation, um, use of opinion polls, um, um, even allowing some criticism of uh, of, of officials, um, and and then. Um, that, so that's that's one category of um, author authoritarians who seem to be able to prosper in this uh, in in the contemporary soundscape. Um, but then we we also look at the 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 rise of authoritarian leaders um, in, of democratic states. So you know people like Orbán in 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 Poland, sorry Orbán in in Hungary, but also the uh, uh, the, the the current Polish government as well. 
um, and uh, authoritarian attitudes, sorry, authoritarian attitudes, that is um, attitudes held by people um, in democracies, but th that actually um, uh, support authoritarianism. And of course, well, authoritarian attitudes and authoritarian systems are, are problematic too. Um, now, um, and this is the, the, in some ways, the hinge on which um, uh, the rest of, the, of, of my talk um, rests. Um, if the soundscape um, is dominated um, by things like motivated reasoning, cultural cognition, filter bubbles, echo chambers, um, then trying to dr draw these kinds of these kinds of categories of citizens, um, or the, the citizens who fall into these um, these these four categories, um, into more deliberative relationships, could be futile or even counterproductive. Um, in contrast, we argue that it is it, can, it may be hard, but it is possible within limits. And so the question is how you do it. And this um, then is the the, the segue to the, the normative part of the book. Um, and there's a lot in there. I don't have time to uh, uh, to talk about um, all the things that we do. Um, there are different things in in different chapters. Um, so I'm just going to pick out um, one thing. Um, uh, it's it's because it runs through um, through through several of the chapters, and this is um, uh, what uh, we can call discursive bridging. Um, and this this begins with uh, discursive psych some dis discursive psychology. Um, discursive psychology was used by myself and um, Simon Nima in an article published in the American Political Science Review in 2008 called represent called discursive representation. Um, um, here I'm going to be putting it to uh, somewhat different use. Okay, so one basic idea from discursive psychology is that a single individual can inhabit um, multiple discourses um, such that uh, most of us will fashion complex subjectivity from participation in many in, in many discourses. Um, so that's a quote from um, uh, Harre and uh, and Gillette. Uh, uh, in one of the, the foundational works on discursive psychology. Um, this is also consistent with um, uh, a, 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 a position I, 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 I adopted um, uh, some time ago by um, well-known uh, 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 political theorist um, Jan Elster, who spoke of um, the multiple the multiple self that we shouldn't uh, treat individual subjectivity as unproblematically unified, uh, that, that there are people may have different selves in Elster's terms, which can be in, invoked um, in different ways at different times. Um, now, um, in this light, um, the problem for, with extremism, for example, um, is that one problematic discourse can crowd out the other discourses that might um, inhabit an individual psychology. Um, so think of somebody, someone whose only source of news is a far-right media outlet, such as one American news network. Um, also, what demagogues try to do, try to do um, is erase discursive multiplicity in the in the vicinity of the of their target audience, and try and impose a single identity. And so this is um, this is um, what we saw. For example, uh, think of when uh, former Yugoslavia broke apart in the 1990s. Um, nationalist demagogues on different sides uh, could use, uh, well, could invoke uh, this this single uh, nationalist uh, uh, identity. And and try and impose that to the exclusion of, of all others, um, based uh, uh, um, for for example on you know social networks that transcended um, national communities or um, or, or um, previous friendships or anything else. And we, we saw a similar a similar kind of thing happened in in Northern Ireland um, as it descended uh, into the troubles in the, in the late nineteen sixties. Um, the other identities, um, say based on class, for example. Um, uh, uh, were erased, um, and the only one that became that became important uh, was as imposed by leaders, or, or as, as reinforced by leaders on different sides and activists on different sides, was a single identity of uh, of religion. Um, in contrast, if individuals um, engage multiple discourse, it flu fluid position is fluid positioning is possible, um, and maybe spaces for reflection might open up. Uh, so, 
Um, one response to extremism, for example, might begin with the identification of alternative discourses that extremist individuals might have access to, um, rather than the one that uh, defines the extremist position based on race, ethnicity, or, or whatever. Um, this is an empirical, not a normative question. Um, so in, in thinking about, um, a, a, about um, people attracted to extremism, we shouldn't necessarily begin with normatively, normatively desirable discourses that we think it would be good for them to, um, to hear, involving, for example, toleration or liberal acceptance of different others. Um, instead, we should look at the discourses extremists actually do encounter, um, not the ones we think we should we, we think they should, um, however far they might be from liberal democratic ideals. Um, this is uh, consistent with the idea that uh, good rhetoricians start with understanding of their target audience. Um, rhetoric is uh, simply persuasion in all its forms. Um, and so what we should try and do um, is look for discursive bridges to those alternative discourses in the milieu of people who might be extracted to extremism or right-wing populism, authoritarianism or, or denial. Um, this suggests that extremism, per se, for example, can be seen as something to be defeated, while people, some people attracted to extremism might be engaged in more deliberative relationships. Um, it's common to note here that the far right is fragmented and may even sometimes uh, contain openings to liberal and democratic values. Um, and this is true, for example, if we look at the extreme right in um, the Netherlands, um, where leaders like um, Pim Fortown and Geert Wilders have claimed to be uh, protecting uh, liberal values against, uh, um, against Islam. Um, uh, this might suggest uh, there's an opening to engage with the far right or people who might be attracted to the far right, not necessarily the leaders, but people who might be induced to vote for them um, in terms of what liberalism and democracy actually require, um, rather than uh, 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 un unremitting hostility to Islam, for example. Um, so this, um, again, sort of thinks, uh, goes beyond um, sort of demonising people who might be attracted to such positions. Um, think of Hillary Clinton on uh, her list of deplorables who she saw as su supporting Trump um, and looking for uh, possible openings. Um, so another opening might come, for example, um, uh, in, there are some far right parties in Europe, um, such as Jobbik in Hungary, which actually have uh, an environmental part of, of their, their platform. Um, so this this might suggest um, thinking about um, what an ethic of care for the environment would actually uh, might um, involve, um, rather than uh, be sort of simply linking it to um, to, uh, to to a, to a far right position. Um, so these these are just um, you know poss possible openings. Um, when it comes to climate denial, um, there's a, a study that was published uh, uh, based on um, um, Alex Lowe's PhD. Um, which was um, which I which I co-supervised, uh, and um, this was based on a, a deliberative forum he ran in Canberra, which had um, some climate change deniers present in it, um, who could be interested in thinking about what to do about climate change uh, once a discourse of distrust in government was invoked. Um, which could be shared with some people who did want action on climate change in the form of um, uh, in the form of a carbon tax. Um, now, the, the 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 key move there was when um, somebody in the group um, suggested that a carbon tax could be thought of as Medicare for the climate. And uh, the, the the point the good the the, the point about Medicare is that um, it's an earmark tax. And this actually attracted the climate change deniers who were present, because um, if the tax is earmarked to actually uh, do something about uh, uh, to to even be to be devoted to to climate to doing something about climate change rather than uh, simply disappearing into general government revenues, um, this is uh, uh, this is a way of overcoming the distrust in government, which uh, which is which is part of a discourse that could be shared by deniers and. Uh, um, uh, and people who wanted to do something about climate change who were who were in the room. So, in other words, this um, was a discursive bridge between the two sides. It actually induced the climate change deniers into a productive conversation about what to do on 
on uh, on on climate change policy, in particular the carbon tax, even though at um, at, at one level they they still uh, didn't believe that climate change was really a severe problem. But it was a way. So it seems par- so it seems illogical in some ways, but um, but it was a way of drawing them into into discourse about a problem, um, a form of discourse which they would have um, in- initially uh, not wished to engage in. Okay. Um, Um, okay, I'll just give, just give one other example. So Pew Foundation finds um, in, a, in a 2017 study, uh, 78% of people think democracy is a good way of governing, but it seems 70, over 70% also support authoritarianism. So what it suggests is over half of the respondents must support democracy and authoritarianism. Um, sounds logical, but what it, again this suggests in a discursive psychology light um, that uh, people who attract are attracted to authoritarian discourses or um, partially inhabit those uh, those discourses can also inhabit crowded discourses. So it's just a matter of um, sort of uh, uh, figuring out how to um, craft a feel appeals uh, in ways which would um, highlight the the more democratic commitments. Okay, um, so. Um, there's lots more I could say, and uh, we have um, much more in many, many more different um, responses in the book, um, but they may come up in the question time. But for now, I'll finish.